Pedicles. So it just uh, just decided suddenly. I'll just uh, get rid of this sign. Oh, here we are. Just so we got it. Yeah, so it's gone. Yeah. So um, yeah. So uh, and this U.S.-led system also was built in 1945 onwards. I, again, I'll avoid the details, but two key arms to the US-led system. The first one was the Bretton Woods institutions, and that's the World Bank, IMF, and including within that framework, the Marshall Plan for the restoration of the West European economies uh, after the end of the uh, Second World War. Uh, and its other leg was a military one, the foundation of NATO in 1949, uh, and its vast network of alliance systems today uh, in Asia, Ch Japan, of course, the main one, South Korea and others, and of course, a network of 800, uh, some people even say 850 US bases globally, uh, and of course, a vast military complex. So this is the US-led liberal order. In 1989, and of course, it was very compatible with a charter system. So I'm not suggesting that there was incompatibility, but they were not the same. So you have the charter international system, you have the US led liberal order, both compatible, both drawing on the same wellspring of Atlantic charter principles and so on, but they were not coterminous. What happens after 1989 is something that still upsets Gorbachev, the Russians and the Chinese, that this subsystem claims to be the system in its entirety. Uh, after 1945, the United States decided an, an excellent book by Stephen Wertheim describes this, Tomorrow of the World, in which he describes the way that after 1945, the United States became a new type of power in which it embedded its global hegemony, because obviously in 1945, 50% of global GDP was, uh, was the US and of course the most powerful military and so on. Uh, the European powers, as always, destroyed themselves in the First World War, Second World War. Uh, but it decided to embed its power in this multilateral bodies, both of its own, which it dominates, and within the charter international system. I hope that make, makes sense. After 1989, this subsystem, in the absence of the Soviet Union, expands and claims effectively to be, you know, US primacy leadership in many ways for the good. It led the uh, um, liberation of Kuwait in 1990, 91, after the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein and so on. So we're not, this is, this is purely an objective, trying to give a, a type of analytical handle on it all. So this is what happens. After 1989, this US-led system radicalizes, liberal internationalism becomes what endless books, Mesheimer, Stephen Walt from Harvard, and Patrick Porter at Birmingham, many others, call liberal hegemony. It dominates. It dominates. And quite explicitly, Bush says, we will work with the United Nations when it goes along with us, and when it doesn't, we won't. And of course, this is what led to interventions without UN sanction in, uh, you have it in Kosovo in 1999, uh, and then you have invasion of Iraq, you have the attack on Libya, and of course the war in um, Afghanistan. So that is a, um, the, the framework in which we're talking about, uh, which, uh, in other words, a grand substitution. Uh, maybe skipping ahead, but just to give a sense of where this, why this is all connected. Uh, Putin went to see uh, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping in Beijing on the opening day of the uh, Winter Olympics, the 4th of February, and they signed a joint declaration. And it's about 13 pages, which is, you know, in words, of course, uh, it was an absolute marvelous defense of charter internationalism. So this is what I'm saying, the backdrop to this war was the defense, and this isn't the first time, but just to simply say just a couple of weeks before, well, just weeks before the war, they come up with this joint declaration in defense of charter internationalism. I'm not suggesting for a moment that they stick to it and that they're loyal subjects, but at least this is the uh, rhetorical and at least the, the theoretical conceptual framework in which this all takes place in their heads. So as Kissinger often said, 
uh, John Mesama also says it, it doesn't matter what uh, we think Moscow thinks. What's important is what Moscow thinks and Beijing thinks. So, um, you know, you may or may not agree with that, but that's an uh, important point. So that's the uh, element. And of course, it's within that framework we then get this enlargement, NATO enlargement. There is just one uh, point, uh, the point I need to make in there. Right from the beginning, as in this post-Cold War peace, two fundamental principles clashed. And it was quite explicit. Gorbachev appeals to charter internationalism. Every single major Cold War, post-Cold War document has a tension within it, reflecting this double duality which I've just outlined. And I refer to the Helsinki Final Act of August 1975, the Paris Charter on a New Europe of November 1990, the Istanbul Declaration of uh, October 1999, and the Astana Declaration of 2010, and many, many more. But if you look at them, and I have done this recently, all of them appeal to two different elements of charter internationalism. The first one is that peace is indivisible, that no country should try to establish its own security at the expense of another. And is there black and white in all these documents. At the same time, these self same documents stress that each state can make its own choice of peace system and alliances and so on. So you have a tension within these two peace orders going on. The one, the Gorbachevian vision, if you like, the charter system appeals to indivisibility of security. The second one emphasizes free choice. And in fact, this free choice idea was uh, very explicitly, Bush senior explicitly challenged Gorbachev's agenda. He explicitly said, look, those Soviets are getting a bit uppity. They're beginning to seize the popular imagination, as I said, some of us are not in the first flush of youth and will remember the years in the late 1980s. Remember the common European home idea. And indeed, many to this day are still inspired by what Gorbachev did at that time and his principles of common of freedom of transcending not just the Cold War, but the logic of Cold War. That's what Gorbachev was about. And quite explicitly, the Washington administration said, you know, it, um, you know, it's down there in the memoirs of Bush Senior and Prince Kokoroff, National Security Advisor. We've got to stop this. They actually said, we've got to seize the ideological agenda. The Soviets have given up communism, revolutionary socialism, but they've done something even worse now. They're seizing the Western agenda as well. We've got to um, get back into the driving seat. And what they came up with, Bush Senior, and it, uh, it's explicit. They come up with this notion of Europe whole and free, which is a deliberate counter to Gorbachev's common European home. And the two symbolize the gulf between two peace orders. So I'll leave that there, but simply to say that both these orders were compatible because both draw on the same charter international principles. A bit of goodwill, a bit of common sense, a bit of pragmatism, a bit of what they call now statecraft. In other words, good old fashioned diplomacy could have reconciled all of this. It could have done. And this is what the astonishing thing, this is what has made this conflict so bitter is because the leadership in Beijing and Moscow and elsewhere say, look, you know, what are we actually, conf what's the conflict about? Because we don't actually disagree with you. We just make, let's, try to make this work, but they didn't because uh, quite clearly NATO, they said, look, NATO enlargement and even NATO enlargement in and of itself is not such a bad thing. Gorbachev, uh, Putin said, look, okay, let us join it. Let us all try to find a way. Even the most um, aggressive partisan of NATO enlargement, Zbigniew Brzezinski, he was national security advisor under Jimmy Carter in the late 1970s and one of the most perceptive comments, and of course, virulent Russophobe, as many Poles are, uh, who actually said, look, NATO enlargement must take place. However, obviously, we can't just do it in a void. 
And we have, and this is his book, The uh, Eurasian Chessboard, The Grand Chessboard, 1997. He says, of course, we must establish an overarching framework to bring Russia and the neighboring states in so that we don't have this hard border, NATO and largest, and we have obviously a conflictual new iron curtain moving endless eastwards. This is Brzezinski in 1997 and so many others. George Kennan, the architect of containment in his Mr. X and Foreign Affairs article in the late 1940s, also bitterly opposed NATO enlargement because he said, look, this is just going to alienate Russia. We'll do the worst thing. This was a country which wanted to join the historical, the political West. It wanted to buy into the full and let the charter international system work within it as it should do. And yet we're alienating a people who did one of the greatest revolutions ever, taking, putting an end to the first Cold War and so on. So this is the, uh, the framework in which that all takes place. And indeed, it's because, uh, as René Girard and others would say, because the sides are so close together that the hatred is so intense at this moment, unprecedented violence, verbal violence on all sides. Uh, my next section would be, but I don't have much time, just a couple of words. Uh, um, so I mentioned the book, Frontline Ukraine, uh, um, which, you know, developments within Ukraine. Of course, I don't have uh, time to go into this, but unfortunately, this split, which I've mentioned, this division of peace orders, then exacerbated and was used to exacerbate internal divisions within Ukraine. Uh, and you know, I certainly have made myself quite unpopular in certain, circum certain, certain circles, because I have always questioned that nationalist vision of Ukrainian state development. Again, bottom line is, two models were on offer after 1991. The first one is a nationalist one, an exclusive one. I use the term monism, a single one. In other words, Ukraine just for Ukrainian nationalists. In other words, the 1996 constitution made Ukrainian language the only state language in a country in which 20% of the population were ethnic Russians, 60% used Russian as their first language. But they saw it as a decolonization exercise. But even if it is decolonization, colonial, uh, col uh, Post-colonial theory says that after colonization, countries become hybrid. Look at India, still using English as one of the lingua francas along with Hindi and other languages. Uh, Canada, which of course is bilingual. Look at Wales, which has been colonized for nearly a thousand years. Uh, and Wales brilliantly solved it by becoming bilingual and marvelously so I might add, uh, with Welsh and English everywhere. And the prime country, and so many of us said it at the time, it we should have become bilingual with other languages as well, uh, Yiddish in certain parts, Polish, Hungarian, Romanian, in the Western parts, which were taken uh, from them by Stalin at the end of the Second World War. Uh, instead of which, you had this vision of an exclusive, and the model became Galician. This is the uh, part of uh, Ukraine, which was never, under the Russian Empire. It was part of the Soviet Union, but it became never, in which it was deliberately set by the Poles and the Austro-Hungarian Empire against the Mos Moscali, the Russians, uh, the Muscovites, and so on on the other side. 1991, and this was the big debates we had at the time, uh, should have gone towards a different vision. Can I just say the nationalist vision was at many times also generous, open-hearted, and it wasn't you know, I'm not, you know, it was also had, you know, a very positive side, civic element to it, nation building. And I certainly am one of the people who would strongly say that Ukraine obviously should have made Ukrainian a state language and compulsory to be taught at schools like uh, Welsh's in well, Wales to a certain level. Uh, so, you know, uh, no one is saying that it should not have become, you know, one of the glues of this new modern independent sovereign democratic state. Uh, so uh, that, that's quite clear. However, uh, by then going to this next point, I make myself, as you can imagine, not too popular with those rather narrow-minded nationalists. By the way, the same issue um, also played out in Latvia 
and in Estonia. Uh, Lithuania had far fewer minorities, um, so it's a type of restitute nationalism, going back to some mythical time earlier. So uh, this um, second vision is the one which I really sort of alluded to, and that is to make Ukraine a multicultural, a multi-ethnic, and indeed to take joy out of its plurality, out of its diverse histories, Nova Russia, which was the bit which Lenin, so Putin is absolutely right. This bit of Ukraine was never part of Ukraine, all the way through Odessa, all the way through to, to Donetsk, until 1922, it was never, but of course these borders were fluid, all countries are artificial. I'm not suggesting for a second that in a sense that they should have been carved away the way they are being done today. Simply saying that this diversity of the way that Ukraine developed should have become a positive, instead of which it became endlessly divisive, that the elites played on the divisions between the two from both sides. The Russophone and the Ukrainian nationalists became more and more intractable, more and more violent, more and more full of hate on both sides hate to the point at which when Donetsk after the Maidan events of 2014 the overthrow of the of Yanukovych uh, to which when the uh, attack on the Donetsk took place that they were the population four million in Donetsk and Lugansk were dehumanized called monsters and it's in the book uh, the language they used and where did this hatred and violence come from uh, so it was already there of course today that Ukrainized language of violence and hatred is we're all becoming Ukrainized in this worst sense in buying into this hatred and violence today. And hopefully this is why you know, I look to a, a, a new peace order. Uh, and indeed, so that would be uh, my um, you know, final point, you know, how, uh, just to, um, I won't go into all the details of how we slid into war, uh, towards the end of 2021 and the various peace treaties, because they were, uh, if you remember just at one point effectively on the 17th of December, uh, um, Moscow put forward a couple of peace treaties, uh, which would have gone back to what Medvedev put forward in 2008. So this, this was nothing new. We've been sliding into war, but it was basically vetoed by Washington in 2008, 2009, and again, the door to diplomacy in December and January when the response came was not closed. There was still a diplomatic option. Uh, but by that point, uh, Moscow decided that we can't really talk because we've been talking about these issues for 15 years. There is nothing substantive about the indivisibility of security as far as the critics would have been concerned. All that Ukraine had to do was say five words. Ukraine will not join NATO. That's all that needed to be done. Uh, it wasn't, it's not going to join, it wasn't going to join for at least two decades. Instead of which, on the 19th of February, Zelensky, at the Munich Security Conference, warns or argues and suggests that Ukraine will become a nuclear power again, just as it was, it was a legacy power from the Soviet Union, which had its lots of rockets uh, based in Ukraine and which left uh, as, as part of the framework of the Budapest Memorandum in 1994. So uh, that's all that had to be done. And yet this is so, no and usually, you know, for Iran, there's been how many sanctions on it when it's wanting to become a nuclear power. When Ukraine declares it may become a nuclear power in the presence of Western leaders, not a peep of objection, not a peep. And these are the trigger events which makes Putin pull the trigger on the 24th. Now, uh, I, you know, this, this is a, an attempt to explain where we got and the tragedy and why it's so deeply embedded this war and why it'll be so intractable and why there is, in my view, almost no way out of it unless, you know, it's endless discussion of what sort of peace treaty there can be. But as far as I'm concerned, and that's what I've tried to suggest today, is that until we even cha we change our mental horizons, of the framework of this war, then there will be no peace. Thank you.
when we do these sort of celebrations, the thing happening with our race in the Chinese way up, Air Force, uh, we're very close to Taiwan. The Americans said that the large force is none of this has been being carried in the region. Similarly, the North Koreans have been raiding uh, the missiles exclusively down the road of the region. I would say it's something that's interesting that part of the world, but it's potentially very serious. And for the it's more likely that part of the world than the region. Shall I respond immediately? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks. That, that's, a, that's a huge, important aspect of this conflict is the whole East Asian aspect of it. I mentioned that joint declaration with Xi Jinping on the 4th of February. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, speculation that you know, the Chinese could use this as an opportunity to go for Taiwan and so on. I, I don't think so. And in fact, Beijing is quite clearly, in fact, gets very annoyed uh, about this. However, that logic which led to us, you know, I, I see what's going on in Ukraine today as just a continuation. Uh, there's a marvelous book by Mark Mazur called Dark Continent, in which you, you know, he, he talks about Europe in the 20th century, plunging into these, what he calls civil war. I see what's going on in Ukraine today. Again, one of those classic civil wars in the North. The global South, does not buy into this, the logic of this, they can't see it. ASEAN, for example, has a different, you know, ASEAN countries, Indonesia and so on, has a different model of the way things should go. However, there is increasing concern that if they can say this Western sickness, you know, basically two Westerners in an empty field will start a war within six weeks, as far as Asians are concerned. I mean, just simply cannot get it out of their head, this militarism and this violence. Uh, and what they're saying now is that the United States has pushed that logic of conflict into East Asia. And uh, Japan, for example, has been mobilized. If you saw Biden was in Japan just recently, this is why it's just going on. In fact, maybe I didn't say this very well. This strategy, yes, they have uh, uh, done quite militantly uh, against Taiwan. This has actually been building for some time this wolf warrior diplomacy, which has been going on and developed for, since 2019. The, the term was introduced, wolf warrior diplomacy, very robust, because basically, as Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, and Yang Qiqi, who is a Politburo member in all of this, have said, for example, that meeting in Anchorage with Anthony Blinken and Jake Sullivan, do you remember that meeting in Alaska, in which the Chinese, who are usually exceptionally polite, said, we, basically, they did a Putin. They said, we've had enough. We've had enough of your Western arrogance. We've had enough of your pushing. You burnt down our summer palace in 1860. You've never apologized for that, etc. This sort of rhetoric, you know, uh, of the, the century of humiliation. And now you're trying to humiliate and import your logic of conflict into East Asia. We've had enough. And now you're also, Trump and Biden, ex Biden, in Japan, if you remember, just a few days ago, and that's what another specific response, he said that, you know, over Taiwan, as you know, the history of Taiwan is that the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek escaped Taiwan after their defeat in the civil war in 1949. And Taiwan, Formosa, until then had always been a province of China for 5,000 years, effectively. And of course they escaped and, the US and Western policy until recently has been strategic ambiguity. They do not recognize the independence of Taiwan. And if you've gone to Beijing to any airport, you will see that Taiwan is a separate channel. I mean, it's, it's separate, but like Hong Kong, but it's separate, but it part, considered part of China, but distinct. Uh, and Biden has blurred that. And so this is why this is going on. It's an exceptionally dangerous situation. So thank you for that. Uh, and can I just say that this war does put China in a very difficult position because Russia has basically weakened itself for generation. It's a pariah state and so on. And China is, doesn't certainly, do, and certainly the companies do not want to be the subject of sanctions, secondary sanctions, if they are too overt. But they've given Russia a degree of diplomatic support which is more than the West expected. 
So there's much, you know, self-congratulation in the West again, the unity in imposing and damaging the Russian economy and harming the Russian people today. And yet, uh, at the same time, they're disappointed that India and China have refused to buy in to this logic of conflict and, you know, pun and collective punishment. Thank you. And one, I think, we may share that perspective. What many of us in this audience also, I think, uh, are saddened by is the apparent um, uh, inability of the United Nations to do much about the scenario that's presented as we can. Can you can you give us any hope that the UN can find a way to resolve it? It's set. Huge amounts of resources in this peace building activity, and yet we're still going through this situation. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, two, two, I suppose, two points immediately spring to mind. Uh, the specific one, uh, and that is the, uh, you know, the, the quality of the UN General Secretary. Uh, and uh, basically, neither Moscow nor Beijing have any faith or trust in Guterres, the uh, UN General Secretary today. Uh, he, he, uh, the way that this selection has gone down, basically, they, you know, they consider the last serious good General Secretary was, uh, uh, was Kofi Annan. Which, who really was a genuine such like, uh, person. And then, uh, and then after that, the US effectively, of course, it's more complicated than that, effectively imposed, and because it had to go from Asia, uh, a very weak one, Ban Ki-moon, who, who was considered, you know, complete, um, you know, had the charisma of uh, Kestam, <laughs> sort of, which means not much. But uh, then, um, and of course, today, uh, Guterres is considered simply a, a basically a mouthpiece of you know, the Western powers. And, and, that is the, and that's the second point. That is the tragedy of the UN, that it has not been able to stand up and act, as I would argue, as the voice and of sovereign internationalism, in, genuine international multilateralism, that peace agenda on which the whole United Nations system is based, instead of which, we have this two things going on that second order which you know bypasses it whenever it wants to uh, which of course is today for example uh, we and this is why they're so upset in particular uh, over in well let's call it the well, the south and the east uh, is that we had the minsk II agreement over settling the donbass and this was then endorsed in february 2015 by a UN resolution. And so this was a framework for peace. Instead of which, we had every six months, the European Union would pile on the sanctions on Russia and it's not even a signatory because what does Minsk II mean, meant? What would it have meant? Minsk was a way to return the Donbass to Ukrainian sovereignty. Good. So, you know, that would have, Crimea was a separate issue, we can talk about that, but the Donbass, because at that point, and this is sociology, sociological uh, surveys, both in 2014 and 15 showed that the Donbass people did not want separatism, they wanted autonomy within Ukraine, within Ukraine, as yes. And it was with the endorsement of the United Nations. Yet, because of the United States and the British, who are always the you know, US's willing helpers, they basically sabotaged its own UN resolution and put absolutely no pressure on Ukraine to do, which wasn't anything against its interest. It was a way of humanizing these people, bring back these 4 million people into Ukrainian sovereignty. Don't punish them, don't, because the UN figures show, UN figures, 80% of the victims and the bombardments came from the Ukrainian, the official nationalist side, and were killing. Even to this day, we don't hear it in the Western press. Constantly, the Ukrainians are bombarding the city of Donetsk. Women and children have been killed, and they have been since 2015. Not a peep in the West. Not a peep. So it's, uh, 
but this was UN. And the fact that the Guterres and his predecessor did absolutely never even mentioned it because the United States would get upset. So the UN is debilitated because of poor leadership, because of the partisan way the UK and US use it. Of course, this is not to justify in any way the also the abuse which comes from China and uh, living France to one side uh, and Russia. And so it's become bitterly divided. The Security Council is, you know, is, is in a, um, you know, has been at an impasse and therefore it has not been able to lead and such like. However, uh, this is not, I mean, this is not to say, you know, my view, it just simply means that we need to do what we're doing today to discuss it and to say, look, this intense polarization and this abuse by, you know, all the great powers, you know, I mean, the UN reform, has, as you, you know, has been on the agenda endlessly, you know, as possible new candidates and expansion. Obviously, the existing veto holders, the five, P5, are not going to give up, but therefore you should add perhaps another couple at least. Uh, I mean, I think UK should leave its seat because it offers nothing particularly, but uh, certainly India to join, Brazil to join, Nigeria, perhaps some others. But in other words, to, to enlarge the Security Council, which would then give a voice to the global South, which I argue, and this is quite clearly in this war, is the voice of moderation and peace. And it's the global North, which is plunging the, globe, the world. And just to add, which you didn't ask, but just to say what's even worse today is that this totally unnecessary war is destroying the agenda of dealing with climate change, which is far more things. And at the same time, it's driving a, you know, a move towards you know, more the nuclearization of international politics. I think, as we know, the bulletin atomic scientists were closer to the nuclear conflict today, far worse than we were in the Cuban Missile Crisis, with a load of leaders who are utterly inadequate for, to deal with all of this. Um, obviously, Biden is, you know, basically, this is Biden's war. Basically, they took a decision, you know, we're not going to, we're going to push uh, and so on. And the United Nations is standing on the sidelines. So thank you for that. It's a tragedy. But that, you know, I just think we double down and support the UN system and you know, say how its principles can work. Um, I've got a question. Yeah. 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 I've just got one quick one. Yeah. People on Zoom, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Uh, so just to take one question to the uh, first question about mainstream, mainstream media. Uh, I mean, I find mainstream media so one sided, so just a negative, uh, that I'm having to go to China Daily, Hindustan Times, Arab News, Russian Times. Asia Times is very good, by the way. Asia Times, Asia Times. Asia Times. Why Asia Times. Why yeah. Is this okay? Debate, two sides of debate you have, you know, there's success and the side of the other, so not getting time. I mean, what benefit can they achieve by this? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. It's it's a bit of disgrace. Um, you know, I'm joking now. The BBC should rename itself the UBC, the Ukrainian Broadcasting Corporation, because it's uh, it's uh, reportage has been beyond bad, it's been tendentious, and in fact, it's been whipping up war fever. So it's part of this Ukraine hysteria, which I think is exceptionally dangerous. The, the feeling is like uh, August, September 1914, is then everybody, you remember they were smashing the German shops uh, in Moscow and in London and so on, or others. It, it's that sort of atmosphere, you know, war fever has seized the nation. And that's why, you know, why, you know an anti-military session like this is so important. The media has utterly disgraced itself, of course. It's right to report about the suffering and the catastrophe and the abomination, which is this war. Of course, no one says it isn't. Um, but, uh, but the way in a tendentious way in which uh, it's worse than this, because uh, as you do, the media coverage is not just bad, it's actually deliberately manipulated. And this is uh, done by this fellow called Alexei Arestovich, who is uh, at the head of Zelensky's a media operation, and they're very clever. You know, he's uh, he's an actor, uh, and uh, he they've hired six hundred 
PR people in Washington alone. I mean, these are companies who then have their you know different things uh, in case to uh, in Washington DC, and they're pumping out this stuff daily, uncritically then accepted by the British media uh, over and over again. Uh, and you know, there's many contested incidents, uh, which but the worst thing is that even anybody who even questions what's going on is then delegitimated and said, you're Putin stooge, you're Putin a Kremlin, a fellow traveler and so on. So it's, as I said, the atmosphere is McCarthyite and worse than anything even in the first Cold War. So you're absolutely right. And what is interesting in all of this is exactly what I, I would have said, is how good the Asian uh, reportage has been. Uh, Asia Times has got uh, uh, this Indian former diplomat, Badru Makima, who has been excellent coverage and the so uh, Asian, I mean, not Japanese, the Japanese have been leaned on and this new uh, Japanese prime minister uh, has repudiated what his predecessors have been trying to build with Russia in a matter of weeks, all that trust has gone and Kishida, I think his name. Uh, so, but apart from, but the Indian has been excellent Indian coverage. And one has to say that the African newspapers have been particularly good. So if you, um, Kenya has, for some reason, and South Africa have been very good. Brazilian papers are very good. So you're yeah, absolutely right. So in other words, what, what the big moment of this in 2022 is another one, is that the global South, the, you know, I end the paper actually on this note um, to say, you know, there's, uh, you know, famous articles, can the subaltern speak? Well, the subaltern, the global south today has found its voice in condemning the craziness of the global north in yet again going to a suicidal civil war. Over what? And they can't say, well, you know, ultimately joining NATO security, you know, obviously you're not gonna do it if it undermines your own security and it leads to war. So what sort of security is that? But you know what, those knuckleheads in the North haven't been able to um, you know, understand that. But so uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to join that guys and thank you very much. It's been very uh, interesting to hear the points and certainly made some points and bells with me. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a kind of a kind of broad brush question, really, because I've been reading around subjects a lot of politics economics history and everything about and you know obviously in ukraine is an example of the way the world is going the conclusion i came to what i'm currently working on is that that this is almost an inevitable process of human evolution it's going on here this fragmentation is breaking down the society you know, it's been accelerated by technology and globalization over the years I don't have a problem with technology and globalization, but it has severely impacted the way that human society is evolving now. And I wonder if you had a view on that, because underlying it wasn't Ukraine, it was something else. It wasn't Brexit, it was something else. It wasn't Trump, it was something else. But it is significant that the way society is going is the way of human evolution, human evolving. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, that's really a marvelous question, uh, and it's I think it really puts a finger on on you know bigger, as you say, the bigger picture, uh, and that in a sense is one reason why I referred to Kennedy's speech because he, towards the end of his life, precisely in a sense came. If you look at that, also you know, if I you know, in, I'm doing you know a sequel to this book, uh, and it's going to be called "The March of Folly Resumed," and it's. Uh, so effectively the march of folly, everybody was marching in folly, uh, but it was, uh, you know, referring to Barbara Tuchman's marvelous book called The March of Folly, which is precisely saying this human evolution all the way back from the Peloponnesian War to the Vietnam, Vietnam War, and she died uh, soon afterwards. But, you know, marvelous book, Barbara Tuchman, and she did a book called The Guns of August, which again has this cold clinical view of this, the lunacy of humans, of humanity. However, that moment, uh, don't forget that that moment, uh, again, some of us not in the front of that, don't remember it much, is you know, not just Kennedy, but at that moment, also the Second Vatican Council was meeting and Pope John the 23rd. And uh, just before that, I think uh, two major encyclicals came out and one just a, just a short time before Kennedy's commencement address in June 1963. And this was John the 23rd and encyclical Pacem Interim, 
peace on earth. And again, another fantastic encyclical to look at. I don't know how well, you know, many of you are Catholics here, but it is bigger than you know, a specifically Catholic thing in which he deals with that. It's marvelous. So this uh, peace on earth and uh, that visionary approach. And you say that's the way it's going. That's the way it has gone because, well, he, John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd died soon afterwards as well, naturally or maybe not naturally, but uh, Kennedy was killed um, soon afterwards as well. And then we got into the Vietnam War, and then we got into uh, all sorts of uh, craziness ever since. And, uh, and that agenda of the early 1960s, the Second Vatican Council, which was absolutely transformative, and that, and remember also, of course, the peace movements of that time, CND and all the rest, uh, and today, if we look around, uh, certainly in the UK, the political sterility, the, the, the vulgarity of public discourse, the, uh, the atmosphere of militaristic hatred, the uncritical, I mean, I mean again, it is not a partisan question point, which I'm going to make now. It's simply to say people we can work with, because I've been working with um, Stop the War Coalition, and that means Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, but we were on a session, again, you know, I'm not making a partisan point, you know, they made plenty of criticisms about his leadership of the Labour Party and so on. But just simply the Stop the War Coalition has been right on the big questions over the last few years of war and peace. Um, but the inter when we were on a session, actually, it was precisely that evening when Keir Starmer announced, and he made any confirmed it a bit later, that Opposition to NATO is incompatible with Labour Party membership. That is unbelievable. This is unequivocal. He says you can be anti-NATO, anti but you can't, you have to be expelled from the Labour Party because the Labour Party we always know is a broad church and its, it's anti-war wing has been, you know, one of its most noble traditions. So in other words, not only is it bad in what you've just said, but it's explicitly making it worse. It is deliberately closing down debate, closing down options and using authoritarian methods to do it. And so the total sterility of uh, our public discourse today and uh, the, the, you know, and as I said, anybody, I, you know, I, do you know, to, I'll be honest, I expected now when we came into the door, I was going to say, uh, is there a picket outside today? Oh, that's interesting. What did you get warnings? Did you? Yes. Uh, because we're talking about peace and alternative. I gave a talk in Canterbury last Monday, uh, and it was at the Friends Meeting House, the Quaker Meeting House, which, you know, really great people. And uh, we had about 20 Ukrainians with a flag and so on outside. And we then, you know, after a little while, uh, you know, said, come in, if you want to join the meeting, come in. Uh, you have to leave your staves outside, your sticks outside. Um, but I came in and, well, you know, I've had this for 20 years. I've had this from the militant nationalist Ukrainians. They stand up in meetings and refuse to let people talk and close down debate. So Ukrainization, which in other words, aggressive, violent, full of hate and so on, uh, which, you know, I've said to them, if you're going to participate in a democratic debate, listen, partake, and you're welcome to do so. That's what we want you to be there. But you know, you have to learn. And it's no good appealing to European values that we, we are especially against these absolute fascist Muscali and so on to their side. You know, we need to transcend this logic of conflict, instead of which it is now being, it's now infecting our body politic worse than ever in my lifetime. However, there is, you know, the, you know, I, one, if there were 10 of me, one of the other works I'd be working on now is, and again, it's not a, again, a party political point, but, you know, I would be working, and my colleagues have been working on at the University of Kent on this thing called Blue Labour. And the other side is Red Tories. This is Philip Blonde. The point is, is how to revive and we, you know, I kept saying to these people, what, what word will we use? Well, there's a good old fashioned word, word and it's called socialism. But of course, I don't mean this in any partisan way, but socialism has to take 
it's, you know, I think you know, we're not talking about Soviet style. We're not talking about nationalization. We're not talking about old fashioned, top down bureaucratic social democracy. We're talking about what is happening at the grassroots in places like Bolton and places elsewhere. This is uh, the mayor of Bolton uh, actually talks and he used this term, normal socialism. That is for people to have decent housing, that their, their wages will meet, you know, so they don't, there's not a choice between heating and eating and all of that. That's normal, call it normal conservatism with a small c. In other words, conservative, small c socialism, small c conservatism coming together in the best form of one nation Toryism and so on. So that is the agenda which we're working on. So, but, <laughs> It's just, I think it's just at the beginning, but I think we are at a turning point that the 40 odd years of, uh, of neoliberalism, which has hollowed out the state, but worse than that, hollowed out public discourse, hollowed out democracy, is we're just at the beginning of a turning point now. So I'm actually uh, reasonably, if, if, uh, if, if they don't get me, um, which they will already condemning, they're sending you know, nasty letters to the university and so on, should be sacked and such like. Um, you know, this is where we've got to. I mean, it's shocking. This is where we've got to, I'm so shocked. Um, but in other words, you know, we have to start rebuilding from the bottom up. Uh, we've got a question. Just to, uh, we've got a question on Zoom, but before that, do you want to focus? Oh, yes, sir. Um, yes. The battery is running. So excuse me. The battery is running low. I don't know whether you've got a lead or something, because it's it's going to um, cut out in a minute. Where's the battery? Yeah. The yeah. back to life. Your question, please? Yeah. <laughs> Let me just repeat for those on Zoom who couldn't hear that. It was. It's turned on at the plug door. Turned on? It's still cut out. They kept saying, Yeah. I can do I can I can uh, cut out. Okay, I will have to uh, do it from my okay. smartphone. Uh, so the question was on um, arms. If you want to take that, then yeah, yeah. thank you, Brad. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a difficult one. On the one side, you could say you're doing as a right to self but uh, of course. Don't forget that it was been pouring in arms and US since 2014, which has provoked this war in Iraq. Okay, not just a not a cancer spelling, but don't forget you have the Kingdom signs a one and a half billion pound contract with the Ukrainian armed forces for the modernization of their fleet uh, and a port. A 
explicitly um, to counter, you know, Russia. So clearly, a very, very provocative stance. And the United States is employing uh, a banner war. A banner refused to sell offensive weapons to Ukraine by Rick Obama. He argued that this was only in play and arms will never um, solve the mission. So, I don't know if I'm going to do this. So, but it was Donald Trump who decided that they began to have a good thing. So, the Ukrainians are friends of arms stingers and all the other stuff. And the British, of course, did a Donald Trump quite a But, second, when peace talks on the 29th of March, when Zelensky himself, it was a, in Istanbul, it was the most positive moment of peace, uh, in which uh, clearly there had to be, uh, had to be sooner or later, which will play the most terrible stuff looking upon Ukrainian people by this war. And you know, accepted it, you know, it's basically elements of neutrality and uh, of, of uh, no data at large, and that sort of stuff actually been done and was on the table before the day. Now, I don't know, that, you know what we don't know, news, but the, the, the uh, media in the global south is reporting, and I'm getting messages from the United States because soon after that, Boris Johnson went to Kiev and told Zelensky not to accept this peace deal. If that is true, and uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence suggesting it was, it would fight on, would fight on the last thing. If he did say that, I mean, of course, Biden's been saying what to say as well, uh, then this would be one of the greatest because arms will not solve this, however much we may pile in. All it does is prolong the suffering because what Barack Obama said. Is absolutely right. Russia has what's called in military terms escalation dominance. It hasn't used more than a tiny bit of its armed force. Yes, it has exposed failings in what it has committed, but the numbers are tiny in military terms compared to what it do. Plus, its vast reserves of arms, which are beyond the Urals, all the way to the Far East, and so on. So yes, it has exposed shortcomings both tactically, communications to strategy and so on. But also, this is a war that Ukraine cannot win, and a war that Russia cannot lose, and vice versa. But it is uh, one that Russia cannot lose because it's next door. And this is exactly what all strategies have said. All NATO exercises since 2014 have shown that the Western forces, the political West, the Atlantic powers, lose any conflict with Russia in the long term. Russia always loses in the short term and wins in the long term. This is the 13th war Russia has been invaded or involved in the Western Western powers since the uh, Peace of the Day. 13th war. Endlessly invaded in the West and the Iron and the NATO Atlantic forces. Uh, it, you know, the Polyonic Wars, uh, the Hitler Accords pushed back uh, to the borders in the outskirts of Moscow, more than those who Moscow, and then when it had closed, the Nazi forces got to Moscow in 1941. So it, it's, it's a war which has to fight, and that's why we want to have a So has to find a piece of the resolution, which the first thing is to fire. These arms will not make what all they do is drag. Basically, that will continue. In my view, this war is going to drag on for months and years. It will debilitate the West. I mean, basically, Ukraine has destroyed itself. It didn't take the West and establish a generous, open hearted polity. It has destroyed itself. It has destroyed Russia, it has destroyed itself. And it will destroy the just like the United Kingdom, Britain destroyed itself in two world wars, this is this third world war, which is the footprints of the third world war, will the political West, the North, is destroyed. We will have mass poverty, inequality, civil disorder, 
by the summer and the autumn. Uh, and indeed, a more and more conflict internal because the stupid is possible. Thank you. We've got a question from uh, uh, Tricia Rogers. Uh, any positive suggestions for way forward? Would it help if Ukraine be became bilingual uh, and not join NATO, or is it too late for that? Well, that could have to be my decision. That is mostly the discussion. Many other languages, but in other words, this nationalist dominant area. I want to see you playing the language, you play in culture, power and development. Oh, I can call it the other Close to the to us. Yeah, and it's all very fine. I know what it is, but no, we just simply don't build for the food in the life. Don't pile in the arms. Don't pile in the arms. Don't establish your as a platform for anti Russian military. This is what it was. I mean, it's actually good. Ukraine, and this is quite explicit. I mean, if you look at what it was so much, because after the fate of well, Kennedy, the United States has never really been back. It has never really examined what part it played in stoking the conflict in the world. That, you know, this isn't a great conflict, very important in some sort, but it, it has to really need the physical. Thank you. It's been a fascinating morning. You explained many aspects going on. My reading is Putin has been saying many years the essay last year Ukraine is not a nation. In various reasons for that. What I don't understand. What the impact can be? So much in the Russian speaking part. Is this is a story of nine and nine? He's taking over some of the next hour. So when you get to the fire. Um, there's going to be three things that you feel. So, where is the direction? They are destroying it. And I wonder what the impact of that is on the Russian. That's an important question. That's why I think there's plenty more that is important. Because if the world is being carried Again, the leadership of David is the last. Also, the 
Soviet and the kind of expert could be the indigenous expert but you simply not learn the simply theory and it answers people to tell the government in books and the many who they sent China to the slaughter through a middle desire continuum to fill the government again. When you know you in the end, Africa has been survived and Russia must have absolutely what I guarantee for this the part of the Instead of these being lord and doing that, they continue to slaughter when you know they simply cannot win that Russia and look only the tiny I think there's a fact that I think the And when um, the and was expected that NATO would like to be which appears to have been done. And from there on, in the uh, Thank you. 
makes angular EP to be east. And that is the angular consolidation. The both things are doing that and so on. And the historical things, again, the fundamental okay, so we can and which is now related to the Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. I think this should be the last question. Please go ahead. Uh, it said, uh, 
Thank you very much. I think with that happy note. Thank you. Uh, please feel free to contribute as you leave, uh, but we need to close shop in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>